It is a great pleasure to be able to give this Tupley address tonight. Uh, as Paul said, the Tupley Research Centre does a very important job uh, really guiding public policy debate and progressive thinking here in Australia. And as a former chair of the uh, Tupley Research Centre, uh, I, of course, am uh, pleased to be here with uh, quite a different hat on tonight. I do want to, first of all, acknowledge the first Australians on whose land we're meeting and whose cultures we celebrate as among the oldest continuing cultures in human history. But I do also want to take a leaf out of Matilda's introduction and pay my respects to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are today's guardians of those ancient and unique cultures, and especially the young people who are here tonight. <coughs> You're the people who are going to carry forward and share your traditions and culture into the future. And uh, as uh, Paul mentioned, we have around 30 women here from the new National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Women's Alliance. It's really wonderful to have you all here tonight. Very special that you happen to be in Canberra. So thank you, Kerry, for uh, somehow making those two things come together. Uh, I'm very pleased to see Tom Kalman and his wife Heather here. Lovely to have you both here. And the head of my department, Jeff Palmer. Thank you both uh, for coming and joining us here. When I uh, agreed to do this speech, uh, the 2010 election was on the horizon, uh, but a little bit further distant. Uh, now I find myself addressing you on day three of Australia's 43rd federal election campaign. So the timing, as it turns out, at least for me, uh, turns out to be excellent. This is uh, a very, very important election. Like all elections, it will determine Australia's future. Both Julia Gillard and the Federal Parliamentary Labor Party are committed to taking us forward as a nation of opportunity and enterprise. And as I think you would have heard the Prime Minister say a number of times, we want to be a country where hard work and responsibility are awarded. But also a place where people get a helping hand during very difficult times in their lives. A place where we work together to achieve great things with confidence, with respect, and very importantly, especially in this area, with hope. I do think that a lot has been achieved in Indigenous affairs since November 2007, but we can't go backwards. We have to keep pressing forward with the reform agenda. We did, of course, come to government with a very, very significant agenda in Indigenous affairs. We wanted to make sure we cut through to find solutions what we, to what we all know are very complex problems that have frustrated many, many governments in the past. All of you know that the old ways have failed Indigenous Australians. So we committed ourselves to a new approach a new approach that had a three-fold agenda for addressing underinvestment, rewarding personal responsibility, and resetting Indigenous and non-Indigenous relationships. Unlike earlier governments, we were determined to pursue both practical action and what you might call the more emotional dimension. We wanted to build concrete action on the ground, but also to build trust and respect between Australians. As a new government, our first order of business, the first thing we did as a new government was the national apology on behalf of the Australian Parliament to Australia's Indigenous peoples, and particularly to the stolen generation. And former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd knew that without acknowledging the injustices and the great hurt and suffering of the past, we could not hope to start moving forward. 
The national apology was unfinished business for the nation. It was a necessary step for change. After the apology, we have been determined to continue to, work, to move forward, to keep building that new relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians based on trust and respect. And not long after the apology, uh, as the new Indigenous Affairs Minister, I went to the National Press Club and gave my first speech as uh, the new minister. And on that day, I laid out our unambiguous commitment to a national and concerted effort to close the gap with very clear and ambitious targets in housing, in health, education and employment. We mapped out the policy principles that have become the drivers of Federal Labor's Indigenous agenda. Very importantly, addressing decades of underinvestment in services, in infrastructure and in governance working with communities to rebuild the positive social and community norms that are so necessary for strong families and healthy communities. And thirdly, strengthening relations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. I said then, and it continues to be the case, that housing would be central to our agenda to close the gap. I said that Federal Labor would deliver not just desperately needed investment in remote housing, but new ways of delivering that investment, new reforms that would transform communities. We were determined to put in place the structural and long-term reforms that were necessary, because we know that that's what is required if we're to close the gap. We have started that process. We've insisted on secure tenure as a precondition for housing investment. And I want to say to you why that is tonight. Absolutely because we want to make clear where the responsibilities lie and to make sure that those responsibilities are enforceable. So that housing asset lifespans can be longer. We've also put in place standard tenancy agreements that make clear that housing authorities and other providers are responsible for maintenance and repairs, and the tenants must pay rent and must look after their homes. So that for the first time, Indigenous people living in remote communities have the same tenancy protections as public and private renters in our cities and towns. Over time, stronger tenancy management arrangements and secure tenure will open up the chance of home ownership where people want it. So we laid out very clear housing targets and measured the state and territory government's progress. And when it became clear, as I'm sure you all read in the media, that progress was insufficient, we renegotiated the National Partnership Agreement with the states and territories. We made it absolutely plain that funding would be reallocated if targets were not met. We insisted on Indigenous employment targets so that local people would benefit from, for, from construction projects in their community so that they get the skills and the training to, to make sure that they could hold on to a job. Now, it is the case that under previous governments, none of these things were consistently in place. There were no public targets for states and territories to meet, no consistent measurement of progress, no employment requirements, no standard tenancy agreements between landlords and tenants, no consistently secured tenure. Just millions of dollars in the past spent with what you'd have to describe as abysmal outcomes. So I don't intend to gild the lily about how hard and long this road has been and will continue to be in remote housing. 
It will continue to be so because the job is very, very substantial. We are making some progress and some of you may have seen reports last week where we have uh, just received the latest information from the states and territories setting out progress on remote Indigenous housing. Their targets were to achieve 320 new homes and 587 refurbishments across the country. Just so you know what we mean by refurbishment, at least a decent kitchen and bathroom to cook and bathe in, safe electricity, working water supply. All up, the states and territories have delivered 316 new homes and 828 refurbishments in remote Indigenous communities last year. Some jurisdictions overperformed and they have kept either their current allocations or received additional funding as a result. Others underperformed and have lost some of their funding. But overall, the combined performance is just shy of the national target we set for new homes. And it's well over the national target for refurbishments. The housing reforms that I signalled as a new minister after the last election are now beginning to make a difference. But we do have a lot more to be done. Across Australia, in remote communities, we're funding the construction of 4,200 new homes over 10 years and 4,800 homes in disrepair will be made safe and functional. As a result of this effort, around 9,000 remote Indigenous families will at last have somewhere decent to live. A place where they can bring up their children in safety and where daily routines like going to work or school are possible. And of course, it's also important to note that in urban and regional areas, Indigenous families are major beneficiaries of the additional new mainstream social housing dwellings being built under Federal Labor's stimulus strategy. These are vital reforms that can make a difference to the future of thousands of Indigenous families and we cannot afford to lose momentum now. Returning to the failed Indigenous housing models of past governments would be a disaster. We also need to keep moving forward across every other element of the work we're doing to close the gap. We've undertaken major reform and delivered unprecedented investment in many areas, in early education, health, jobs, remote services, governance, I mentioned remote housing, and of course also infrastructure. And our major investments in education, health and social housing will have significant benefits for Indigenous people, especially in urban and regional Australia. In education, we do want more Indigenous young people to benefit from the transformative power of education. A decent education is always, but always, the most powerful antidote to disadvantage. We are implementing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Education Action Plan. We'll make sure that disadvantaged Indigenous children benefit from federal labour's substantial investments in education, regardless of where they live. We're supporting Chris Zara's Stronger, Smarter Learning Communities Program, and this aims to transform the expectations of Indigenous children through high-performing hub schools, supporting other schools in their region. And we're working with Noel Pearson, whose Cape York Welfare Trials, supported by the Australian and Queensland governments, are helping communities stand on their own two feet, seeing more children getting to school. And the Cape York Aboriginal Australia Academy is now already getting good results, finding new ways of boosting academic achievement. <coughs> 